I warned you not to listen to that, Kits My Goat. Now look at you. And we're back! Yes. So this is That Gets My Goat on the Go, episode three? Episode three. Although it's just going to be a regular That Gets My Goat number. I don't know what number that will be. It'll be. It'll we're probably be. 100, aren't we? Well, I, I guess by this point we may be over 100. Because I think we were at 98 before we left for Vegas, and we've done two since we started driving, so we may be at 101 already. Cool. Okay. What we were talking about last time was the Dune Steve is evolving in a way. Maybe it's de-evolving. <laughs> and is that, that's not correct, is it? De-evolving, but it's de-evolution. Thank Something. You, who knows? Who cares? What is de-evolution? <laughs> yes. Six years later, I know all the answers. Yeah, well, who are the Bay City Rollers? But we were talking about in 2013, we're probably going to do a lot more of our stories. Story by me, stories by you, and then the occasional story we collaborate on. At least once, we'll try that. Because, well, twofold. Because we need to write more and put out our own writing more because we want to be writers. We want to be paid for our writing. We want That's how I want to make a living. And if you don't share your work and get people that are like, hey, I liked that, I'd buy something from you, then we're screwed. So that's the first reason. But the other reason is because last year you wrote a story on demand, sort of. We didn't have any episodes in the can or anything ready to go. And it's like, well, we can wait a month and then try and do another episode. Or one of us can write something and next week when we get together, we'll record it and we'll have a new episode. And and we did. And it was a positive experience. And so we were talking about doing that a lot. Maybe recording a couple of stories that we could do episodes on when there's a lull, when there's producers that don't have anything for us, for the regular show or whatever the deal is. And then, yeah, just if it encourages us to write, then do it all the time. I mean, if this is a trick that gets a fire under us to write something we wouldn't otherwise feel motivated to do, then we got to do it all the time. Uh, I think that... Basically, what was my plan was that I need that kind of a motivation. I was even considering, in the first place, just setting it up so that, oh, hey, we have to do at least one story a month by us. So I'm this month, you're next month, then I'm the next month after, and it just keeps going like that back and forth so that we have that many stories by us guaranteed. And then, you know, we could even do more beyond that if we're able That was my original plan. Um, I don't know that we're going to go so far as that to begin with, but I think eventually, as long as it works out, we will. And as long as we have producers that are willing to help us, then we've got to take that into consideration. And if they've got a story by, like you said, Mike Resnick, that's ready to go and it's our turn, then of course the Resnick story is going to go. I mean, why waste the finished story? I I don't mean that, but, but why waste the slot on something that is not yet done? when you've got something that is done. And I was thinking about how you just wrote a story on demand and that we have a relationship with some writers out there. I mean, I don't know that we're close enough to Mike that he would write a story for us. I I think we're getting there, though. I mean, I could probably send him an email and see what he thinks. But it would be fun if there were a couple of writers who had sold us stories before who like us or we like them that I could say, hey, we don't have anything for the first week in October. Here's a list of Metallica song titles. Pick one of these titles and write a story based on this song title. And then when that title is gone, we've got four Metallica titles left. Uh, To me, that would be really fun to say, hey, would you write a story? The only problem is, and and maybe you can think of a second one, but the, the, the problem that I think of is, what if the story's really bad? We've asked somebody to write it we've commissioned a story basically and uh, if it's bad we are obligated not only to put it on the air but to pay for it and put in I don't know 20 hours producing this story I I wonder about that because for example Norm Sherman on the Drabblecast does commissioned stories every year where it's like we asked Tim Pratt to write a story about genital warts Here it is. And I wonder, has he ever gotten a story where he's like, oh, geez, this wasn't even about genital words. Come on. You know, and he's like, but I said that I would buy it and now I have to. And 
What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I guess that could be a problem. The problem I see is being much more likely as far as that goes is that, yeah, we got to buy it. And if you're going to get someone to write a story specifically for you, you're probably paying a lot more for it than we normally pay for a story. Because, uh, especially if we ask Mike Resnick to do it, that guy lives on the money he makes writing. He's not going to do it for our rates. He might take an old story that he sold a hundred times and give it to us for those rates, but sure as heck isn't going to write a brand new one. Spend hours and hours working on it, I would think. Okay, maybe not Mike, but if there's somebody out there who considers us friends, like J.M. Perkins put me on his Christmas card list. Okay? Nobody's ever done that. Nobody sends me Christmas cards. Nobody. <laughs> you don't need to get one from Ian? No. <laughs> like that one with the weird face? Oh my gosh, that was so <laughs> effed up. It was like some menagerie thing. It was like, step right up, folks. These kids are all deformed, but in different ways. And, oh, which is cruel. Like, yeah, we probably should have edited that part out. But it was it was a cool voice. Yeah. Is, is, sorry, his father is deformed, but in different ways. A real quick cool voice uh, side comment. This is off of the show. Alan Tudyk does a voice on uh, Wreck-It Ralph. Wreck it Ralph. And it is, I would never in a million years have guessed that was Alan Tudyk. Yeah, he does. A, uh, he does the Mad Hatter, basically. Yeah, from, what's his name? Ed Wynn. The guy that used to say, oh, it's a wonderful day, don't you know? Oh, it, yeah. it's a great, yeah. A life is for the living. Yeah. That, right? Yep. So that's it how Ed Wynn talked. Anyway, Kevin Smith talked about it in his podcast because Ralph Garman was pissed because he does Ed Wynn all the time. And it's like, they could have paid me a tenth of what they paid Alan Tudyk, and I would have done that same boy. Yeah, I was uh, pretty impressed. You know, it's really impressed. Alan has two dicks. Oh my gosh, that is impressive. Um, okay, so I was saying, uh, they're all deformed in different ways. Who's card? I don't know. I, I get the impression that he thinks of us as friends, and maybe there are some out there that are like that. Again, uh, who was the guy who said, you know, I could send you a couple of stories for free that you could put in some kind of anthology to pay for so that you could make money? I think that may have been J.M. Perkins. Okay, well, this guy's just a saint then. <laughs> but I, I liked the Broken Mirror story experiment, and I liked the October Scary Story events, the, the two that worked... Because it's it just feels like the first time. It feels like the very first time. It feels like I've gotten a bunch of friends together and it's like and we're playing a game, a writing game. You know, like those games where I start a story and then you continue and then you pass it to your friend until we get to the end and we read it and it's like oh abortion. And I just, I, I, I like those kind of creative games. And, you know, I know that there were people that didn't like the rules for the last Broken Mirror story event. And, and you know, part of me is, it wants to say, tough titty, said the kitty, but the milk's still good. And another part of me said, what, are you 12 years old? Why do you say stuff like that? <laughs> and another part of me says, well, okay, I understand that we're asking you to work on spec and there might not be any remuneration. Ooh, nice use of the correct word. But that wasn't why I wanted to do the Broken Mirror story thing. It was because, hey, hey, friends, let's get together and do something fun. And so, yeah, I'm always thinking up little contests or little writing things that we might do in the next year or the next s- step of the Steve's devolution. <laughs> Damn it! De-evolution, Alex. Wait, what is devolution? No, that's what I said! And I was wrong. I lost $600. Best, best yet is you repeated the same thing that the guy before you said. Don't reveal that, then I'll sound like a moron. <laughs> I've told that on the air, right? Or did I cut it out? I'm pretty sure, yeah. It's, it's way back when from very early episodes, but I'm pretty sure you did tell it on the air, yeah. It's funny. I think about my audition for Jeopardy all the time. It, it's It's been like six years, like I said. And... Uh, last week, Jeopardy was on one of the monitors at... We went to the Red Rock Casino in Vegas. And the whole time, I was thinking, Oh, who are Joan Jett and the Blackhearts? You know, the, the music ones should be easy because I like music. Yeah, didn't you? You did that game show. What was that game show podcast called? I've forgotten the name of it. Where you were the grand champion 
of that game show podcast, and it was it was Liz's husband, right? It was the you did it too. I did, yeah, but I wasn't the grand champion because I blew it on the Michael Jackson. You had the chance to be a grand champion. Yeah, and you blew it. <laughs> I'm ready to tell you Yeah, I thought you were going to go there. You did really well with that one, and it's funny because a lot of, the majority of the points you got was off of the music. Guru, something Guru Showdown, Guru... Yeah, I think that's what it was, Guru Showdown. So yeah, you uh, you did really well with that one, and... You know what I did with my winnings? I bought the four Game of Thrones books with my winnings. The, you know, the... J-R-R... Martin, yeah, the Tolkien. Song of Ice and Fire series. And so, you know, I, I think about that all the time. If I hadn't won that, would I have... I still would have read those, I guess. Yeah, you probably would have. But it made it easier to do, at least. So let's go back to what we were saying. Come up with these ideas for contests, not just because it's filler for the show, but because I appreciate these kinds of things. The motivation, it was like we were talking about in the last episode, when somebody says, I need you to write this... Or here's a, a contest that anybody can enter. I thrive on that sort of thing. Partly because if you go back to the very first, <laughs> that gets my goat on the go. My brain can only hold so many story ideas. Maybe they're all battling for supremacy within my head. And a lot of them fall by the wayside and die and are never heard from again. But if one of them has a deadline or one of them has a dollar sign or one of them has... I don't know, maybe Abby will like me if I write this. Okay, that's never happened. Attached to it, then it will have the strength to go up those steps in Philadelphia, you know, and and, and I guess I'm just weak, internally weak, and I need any kind of push or motivation that normal people just come up with on their own. Real writers probably all came up with that stuff on their own. You and I, wishing to be real writers, are still trying to figure out how to do it. It's one of those things, it's funny because you keep talking about your ideas like that. That's one of the stories that I brought with me printed out. <laughs> a story about the ideas that were angered that they couldn't get out of the writer's head. Okay, and, and we're going to record that, correct? Yeah. So, again, listeners, ask where that story is. If you're listening to this and it's April and you still haven't read that story, you need to bug big about it. We need the chorus. We need the, 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 the peanut gallery. We need somebody, maybe it's the hecklers, to tell us, hey, you guys said you were going to do something and you didn't do it. I had a, when was it last year or the year before, I was in line at Comic-Con for the Hall H Saturday morning thing. And I started to write a story. And my battery died before I finished the story. And so it was like two-thirds of the way done or whatever. I just thought it would be fun to just write a story while I was in line, make use of my time. And I published it on my blog. This was in 2011. And in March or April of 2012, there was a comment on there. And the guy said, hey, what happened to the rest of this story? It was going so well. What happens next? And I was like, dude, where were you in August or July (laughs) when I still knew where this might have gone? Nobody said anything for all that time. And so, of course, the story is dead. Anyhow, I, I keep saying the same thing over and over, but I need a push. Maybe I think that other writers are the same way. It's like, I haven't written anything since September. But hey, Rich just emailed me and he says he wants a story called, you know, The Thing That Should Not Be. Or what, what's another Metallica title that we haven't used? Metal Militia. Okay, Metal Militia. I'm going to write this story because... My friend, Rish, is asking me of a favor, but also because, hey, it's a push, and I hadn't been able to come up with anything on my own, but oh my gosh, thinking about Metal Militia, I have three story ideas. It could be one of these threes. I could write all three. And I don't know, is that unrealistic? Are people not like that? I don't know. I think it's possible that it can work that way. I know that when you do that with the broken mirror every year, you don't just come up with one idea. You come up with as many as you can and then decide which one's the best kind of a thing. And sometimes even write a second one as well and put it in there under a different name or a third one or etc. So, who knows? And I understand that every writer is different. Like you said, you know, there are pants and there are plans and there are... Is there a third? Or the... There's the Speedo ones. <laughs> you know, I, I lived in Los Angeles for a number of years to be a screenwriter. That's what I wanted to be. 
And there were a lot of people that I would run into who wanted to be screenwriters. They were all there to write for the movies. They loved the movies as much as I did, if not more. And they were there working in a video store or working in an office or working in a sweatshop, whatever it is. But what they really wanted to do was write for the movies. And I would be like, wow, you and I are brothers whenever I would hear this. When I first moved out there, I'd be like, really? That's so cool because there was only one other guy in school with me that wanted to be a screenwriter. That's so cool. And I'd be like, how have you been doing? How many screenplays have you written? I mean, have you sold anything? And And invariably, nobody had written a damn screenplay. Nobody! It was my second year in Los Angeles before I finally met somebody who had written a screenplay. And it's just like, wow, I want to be a basketball player. I've never held a basketball. I've held a lot of other balls, but not a basketball. What I was saying is, hey, we are brothers. But I wasn't brothers with these people. I was so surprised that all these waiters or whatever that wanted to be screenwriters didn't screenwrite. If you go to L.A. because you want to be an actor, you can do community theater. You can do student films for free. You can be an extra. You can pay your bills being an extra on film sets of real shows and movies and hobnob with casting directors, hobnob with other actors, hobnob with guys that want to do porn. Hobnob with hobgoblins. Do you know what I'm saying? If you want to be an actor, there are infinite opportunities for acting. But if you want to be a screenwriter, you have to write. And to find out how many of these guys didn't do it. I'm, okay, now granted, it made me feel superior to them. And that doesn't happen a lot for me. Usually I have the inferior guy. But it was just like, wow, I write a screenplay a year. And I slack off a lot. That's so strange that you guys have never written any. You know, or it's you know, like I've been working on one. It's about a third of the way done. Or I have an idea of how the movie should be in my head. But... Unless you write it down, it it doesn't exist, dude. It follows you when you leave the room. It's not going to stay in the room when you leave. I just... There are other... Like like a stinky fart might stay in the room after you leave. See, much more worthwhile than the idea that they have in their head. That's so you to bring the subject back to you. (laughs) That, That was something that shocked me. To find out all these people, they were writers, but they weren't like me. So I know that there are other kinds of writers and other people that do certain rituals, they have their exercises or whatever, and maybe for one of them to get an email from a guy who says, hey, we got a podcast episode with your name on it. You know, I am $20. I know it's not a lot, but it's it's a pittance, but it's it's just so you can say, hey, I sold a story to the Dune Steve, rather than one of those podcasts that's like, I gave a story to those guys. I, I don't know if that makes a difference to that person or not, but there have to be people to whom it does make a difference. And who would say, hey, thank you for this opportunity. Here is Metal Militia. I think it's really good. You talk. Oh, shoot. I had something I was going to say, too, and I've forgotten it in the yeah, time while you were speaking. One thing, I know you, you talked a little, or you ranted a little about, it's gotten warm, hasn't it? It's actually it's 43 degrees. Oh my god. It's actually nice. We're alive. Like the sun has come out. That makes a big difference. And the sun is glaring in the uh, windshield and actually making me hot for the first time in uh, it feels like months. <laughs> I was reading a book. It was actually a diet book, but uh, I was reading it and I, I found that it had a lot of things that I could take the advice and put it towards writing as well as towards dieting because they're kind of similar things at least for me they're they're yeah they require discipline and they're goals that I want they're things that I want to make myself do Uh, one of the things that they were saying and it's something that I think I'm going to try and do this year and I may start just doing it every time I introduce myself or something but they say that you need to call yourself what you want to be so that it kind of changes your mindset Instead of saying, hey, I'm Big Anklevich, I'm an aspiring writer, you need to just say, hey, I'm a writer, then you will start doing what you say you are kind of a thing. You are what you say you are. I'm Colin Frizzle, and I've got a big knob. Uh Uh-huh. So, yeah, the bears are who we thought they were. 
you, you just got to do that. Maybe that's what all these people that you were meeting in L.A. were doing. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm a writer. I want to write for the movies kind of a thing. And they're trying to motivate themselves like I need to. It's one thing that I think I may even start doing each episode as I introduce myself. Say, hi, I'm Big Anglovich and I'm a writer. So that I actually do that and make that part of me instead of just wishing that I was and saying, yeah, I'm just an aspiring writer. I mean, that's what they said to do it in that diet book is, you know, you just don't say you want to be an athlete or something like just say you are say you're an athlete in training that's what you are and you're going to change the way you are by and especially with that athlete in training i mean anybody could be an athlete in training even if you're fat you train yourself until you're not or whatever but that's kind of something that is perhaps a mind game that can trick you into turning yourself into something else i guess i doubt that's what those people were doing it's one of those things where, like, people dream that they want to be rich, but the only thing they ever do to achieve that is buy lottery tickets. And so they might as well do nothing at all because you have more chance of being repeatedly struck by lightning and attacked by sharks at the same time than you do of winning the lottery. And you hear those kind of things applied to any... I, I don't even know how to describe any vocation... That's not doctor, lawyer, teacher. The chance of being a successful writer is, you know, you're, there's a greater chance of being struck by lightning than being a professional baseball player. There are, are as many aspiring actors in Los Angeles, you know, whatever it is, you'll hear those kind of things. And when we were in school, how many times would you say somebody told us, most of you are not going to make it. If you can do something else, do something else. How many times do we hear that? I mean, at the very least, once per course, you know what I mean? Like, every teacher would tell you that at least once, like, at the start. And often there were many classes where they would tell you it, like, once a week. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, your likelihood wasn't good. It, yes, it's a, it's a competitive business, or the field of writing, of professional writing. It's really, really hard to actually make a living writing. And, and I don't know. I mean, when I read that thing by Dean Wesley Smith, he talked about, you know, it's fairly easy to make money writing. There are all these ways to do it. The trick is you have to make enough that that's your sole income. And very few people do that. But the thing that they would say again and again, and they say in books about writing, they say books about acting, they say books about filmmaking, books about, I don't know if it's dieting in those as well, but they all say, you know, if you can do anything else, you should try and do something else because it's easier, because you're more likely to succeed. However, if this is what you feel like you're born to do, if this is the only thing that can make you feel alive, then go for it. Then try to fulfill your dream. Otherwise, you will always regret. You will always be miserable. And I don't remember if there were people in school that said that second part. I think they were much more pragmatic and much more of the first school of, hey, look, this is really hard. Most of you will fail. If you got any fallback, dwell on that. Yeah, we did get that a lot more. I mean, I think the second half was just what we all thought in our heads. Oh, we got to do it, though. And we've all wound up doing something else, except for the few of us that had all the tools necessary to do that. You know, it was funny. I was thinking about that the other day. Like, we have our friend Ian, who actually works in Hollywood, and he had the right personality, I guess you would say, to be able to do so. And I was thinking the other day, if, if you were to somehow take you and I and like merge our brains together and merge our personalities into one person, I think we would have what it would take to make it. But unfortunately, we're two separate people and are therefore uh, not quite adequately uh, equipped. If we did merge us together, then maybe we could be like Alan Tudyk. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't funny, man. Alan Tudyk was in Serenity. That's right. <laughs> uh, there was a guy who I think he graduated with us. I was never really close to him. I always felt like he was a bit of a hose beast, actually. <laughs> hose beast? Please ex explain. I, I just I didn't like this guy, and I can't even remember his name right now. But he went out to L.A. The, about the same time that I did. And he was... There's a certain type of personality that flourishes in the entertainment business. And it's somebody who is very outgoing, very people-centric, 
but also very insincere. Somebody who will tell you what you want to hear, who will tell you how nice you look, even though he doesn't feel anything. You know, who can just come up with praise and bullshit and sell it as though, hey, it's all genuine. In film school, they referred to this as schmoozing. And I hated it. There was actually a class where the teacher would ask us, okay, stand up and schmooze with so-and-so for five minutes. And, and I, oh my gosh, it was so hard. And I don't know why, because as an actor, you're supposed to be able to step into somebody else's shoes and just pretend to be that person. But I could never, like, pretend to be somebody who, oh, hey, I'm the life of the party. Oh, are those real? Ha <laughs> ha, check this out. I was not that guy. But this guy, and, and Ian to a lesser extent, Ian was more sincere. Ian is a good guy. But this guy was that without the sincerity, without the underlying decency that Ian had. And he went out and he was successful almost from the beginning. And I remember he worked for... I, I want to say Joel Silver. He was a receptionist at Silver Pictures. And I went to the Warner Brothers lot one day. And he was there. And he said, hey, come on over and we'll do lunch. And I saw, you know, it's like how successful this guy was. And I was so unsuccessful. And I wasn't going where I was supposed to go and all that. And he just, it, it just made me feel worthless. And then last month, I was working this menial job. Nothing to do with entertainment industry. And he came in. And he had quit the pursuit of his dreams and come back from Los Angeles with his tail between his legs, as most people do. But he still was able to feel superior to me because I was in this menial job. And the funny thing is, is, this is the kind of guy who could lie and you would believe him. He's like, oh, no, I'm here because we're doing a miniseries here or whatever. <laughs> it's like, my life is great. Two dick. And I was just like, wow, that guy saw me in this menial job and he, once again he can feel superior to me. I guess this is a rant about other things, about the Los Angeles mentality or, or anything like that. But I just, I wish I had a fallback that paid good money and I could just write for pleasure. Writing for pleasure, you mean writing erotica? You know, I haven't really tried that. I would like to try that. Didn't we know somebody who writes erotica under a pseudonym and that they do quite well with that? I th think so. I can't remember who that was. It's one of our authors that has been on the show, I think, did that. That seems like it would be really cool. And and again, it's like the person who watches... I don't know what he watches. He watches professional lacrosse on ESPN2 and says, Oh, I could do that without any idea of how much work or discipline or muscle it takes to do professional lacrosse. With me, I, it seems like, oh, I could write eroticism. You know, I'm lonely. I have needs and an imagination. You know what I mean? That, that's my mentality is like, well, I know what it's like to yearn for somebody and simply just have them get together in the story. That works, but it may take totally different talents and muscles that I don't have to do that. I think that's called a romance novel you're talking about. Erotica is a little different. <laughs> I don't know that there's all that much yearning. There's a little more uh, bodily fluids. All right, noted. If somebody has an in to the erotica fiction business, send me a Metallica song title, and I will write an erotic story that fits that. All right? Okay. I'm thinking uh, Enter Sandman would probably be a good one for that, although Sandy might not be so good. That makes me think of when... Uh, what was it? A lot of Fagina changed her name to Sandy Fagina? Ooh, yeah. That's terrible, sir. <laughs> All right, have we run our course? Do we need to uh, end this episode? I think so, but like I said before, we could talk about this all the time. I am passionate about it, and yet I'm also frustrated, not just with myself, but with the world in general. And when you feel frustrated and passionate, uh, it makes for drama. It makes for something that hopefully is entertaining to listen to. And uh, again, you guys can mention in the comments your own thoughts and your own aspirations and suggestions. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, I'm signing out. A big Anklevich. I am a writer. I'm Rich Outfield. And I've got a big knob. Hey, that ain't funny, man. That guess my goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Big and Rich are a national treasure, man. <laughs>
Oh shoot, we were recording. <laughs>